Hey everyone and welcome back to Civics Review. Today's video is a suggestion from Anne Marie B. And she's asking, do you also have resources for quarter three? Well, Anne Marie, yeah, now we do. I'm sorry. And just like that, quarter three is in the books, which means the EOC is coming up soon. And man, were you trying to pay attention in civics and focusing on all the right things, but sleep was inevitable. You fell asleep in class, and when I say fell asleep, I mean you slept the entire semester. It wasn't always easy or comfortable finding ways to sleep in your civics class without your teacher knowing, but you found a way. You even grew out your bangs just so you could sleep in class undetected. That is dedication. Forget about those posters you see in class of somebody climbing a rock wall, working really hard. What you did in civics was hard work and I applaud and salute you. But now you find yourself in this position, running out of time and needing to pass the EOC. And so what I'm gonna do for you today is try and wrap up all of quarter three in this very short video. When last we left off in this video series, we were talking about the preamble to the concept Constitution, and man, that was a lot. But unfortunately, that's just the introduction. Quarter three covered everything else. So we're gonna run through the three branches of government, and that's the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. And I guess the first thing we wanna mention is when we divide the power into three parts of government, we are limiting the power of the government. We've already seen what happens when one person gets control of all of the power, things go badly. And so we have designed our government into three branches to limit the possibility of one of those branches becoming too powerful. The three branches of government are defined in the U.S. Constitution and it organizes them all nice and neat. Article 1 is about the legislative branch. Congress and lawmakers, what they can and cannot do. Article 2 is about the executive branch, the president, the vice president, and all of the executive departments. Article 3 is the judicial branch, which includes the Supreme Court. And we're going to start off with the legislative branch. Now, the main function of the legislative branch is to make laws. They are lawmakers. And man, are there a lot of them. The reason for this, of course, is the word bicameralism, which means two chambers. One chamber of these lawmakers is based on the population of each state, and we call that the House of Representatives. The other chamber is based on equal votes, no matter how many people you have in your state, and we call this chamber the Senate. Okay, so what's going on with the House of Representatives? This is a chamber that is made up of lawmakers, and there's a whole lot of them, 435 to be exact. Now, they represent the people, which means depending on how much population you have in your state, that's how many lawmakers in the House you're gonna get. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. Florida has a lot of people. They're in the top three in the United States, and so they're gonna get a lot of representatives in the House. 27 to be exact. Georgia has a smaller population. They've got a lot, but not as much as Florida. And so they're going to receive 14 members of the House to represent their state. And Wyoming, poor Wyoming, has a very small population. They're only going to get one representative in the House. We call this proportional representation, and this is a benefit for the states that have lots of people. Now, the House of Representatives is considered to be the lower chamber or the lower house, and that's because some of the qualifications to be a member of the House are less than the other chamber. Requirement number one, you've got to be 25 years or older. Requirement two, you have to be a citizen for at least seven years, and requirement three is you have to live in the state you want to represent. Lesser qualifications also means a shorter term. Members of the House of Representatives only have a two-year term before they need to be re-elected again. That was the House of Representatives in a quick nutshell, but the word bicameralism means there's another part, there's another chamber, and we call that the Senate. So let's check this one out. In the Senate, there are 100 lawmakers, and we call this equal representation, meaning there's two lawmakers in the Senate for every state. Doesn't matter how many people live in that state, everyone gets the same. Florida has two senators, Georgia has two senators, and Wyoming has two senators. The Senate is designed to give states with smaller populations equal representation. 
Now, senators are said to represent the states, while members of the House represent the people. So what does this mean? Because the state of Florida and every state in America has only two senators, anyone from the state can call either one. They both represent the entire state. But in the House of Representatives, states with more population are divided into districts depending on how many representatives your state has. Florida has 27 members of the House, and so they have 27 districts. If you live in this tiny district, you're gonna call this guy. If you live in that tiny district, you're gonna call this lawmaker. So that's what it means when they say senators represent the state. Because there's only two for every single state, they represent everyone in the entire state without caring about districts or population. The Senate is also considered to be the upper house, which means there's more qualifications and more responsibilities for this chamber of Congress. The first qualification is you have to be at least 30 years old, you have to be a US citizen for at least nine years, and live in the state you represent. Not exactly more difficult requirements, but slightly more difficult. The qualifications to be a lawmaker in any of the chambers is still absurdly easy to meet. Now meeting the qualifications for the upper house is gonna give you more benefits, and one of those is you have a six year term. You also have powers that lawmakers of the other chamber do not have. In the Senate, they can approve presidential appointments. So when the president of the United States is choosing his homies to work in his executive branch, the Senate has the power to approve or deny those appointments. They can ask the president to choose someone else. Senators can also ratify presidential treaties with other nations by approving them, or they can deny them and say, uh, we don't like this one. It's not what's best for America. Finally, senators get to try those accused in impeachments, and this includes the president of the United States. That is some serious firepower that these senators have that members of the House really can't do. They don't have very much interaction with the president, they can't check the president's power. But here's what they can do that the senators cannot. Any bill that's about taxes has to start in the House of Representatives. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, senators. In your face. Hey, look, it's not a great power to have, but it's something they can do that the Senate can't. Oh yeah, in order to start the impeachment process, the House of Representatives has to pass an article of impeachment. The Senate really can't remove a president from office until the House acts and officially passes an article of impeachment. Together, both the House and the Senate can do these things. They can declare war, create an army and a navy, create a post office, borrow money or coin money, create taxes, and regulate trade. Oh yeah, and as lawmakers, they can make laws. Speaking of which, the lawmaking process is a very complicated one, and the Founding Fathers kind of wanted it that way. Remember, under King George III, it was quite easy to pass laws like the Stamp Act or the Townshend Revenue Acts on the colonists, and the Founding Fathers didn't want that to happen in the new nation. And we are of course talking about the federal lawmaking process and not the state lawmaking process. They're a little bit different. The lawmaking process starts with legislators from the legislative branch writing out a proposed idea for a law, which we call a bill. In order for this bill to become an enacted law, it's gonna have to go through edits, debates, and votes, and all throughout this process, it's probably most likely going to die. If one chamber of the legislative branch does manage to pass the bill and vote on it, it's gonna go to the other chamber to repeat the same process of editing, debating, and voting, and it's most likely going to die. But if they can both agree on the bill, and that number we're looking for is a simple majority vote of 51%, then they're ready to move on to the next step. The bill will find its way onto the president's desk where he'll have a couple mm -hmm. of options on what to do. He can sign the bill and then it becomes a law. He can veto the bill and then it doesn't become a law and goes back to Congress and they see if they want to override the president or rewrite the bill. Or he can pocket veto the bill and hope that Congress disbands while it's still in his pocket and then it's really secretly vetoed. All right, we're done with the legislative branch, so enough of that. Let's move on to Article 2 of the Constitution, which talks about the executive branch. Now, the executive branch includes the president, the vice president, and the presidential cabinet, which includes the executive departments. 
No, it's not an actual piece of furniture full of advisors. Now, believe it or not, the executive branch is actually the largest branch in the federal government. Surprise, it's not just two people and a group of advisors. Deep beneath the surface and what goes mostly unnoticed to the public are 15 executive departments filled with millions of employees. The main function of the executive branch is to enforce the law, and these millions of employees help the president do just that. Article 2 contains the requirements for being the president of the United States. Number one, you have to be born a citizen of the US. You cannot become a naturalized citizen and be the president of the United States. Requirement number two is you must be at least 35 years old. And requirement number three, you must live in the United States for 14 years, and these don't need to be consecutive. Well, let's go over the powers of the president, because he can do a lot of things. The first thing that's written in Article 2 is executive power, and it really doesn't include any other information other than he has executive power, which essentially means he's the boss and has the power to enforce the law. The next power given to the president is that of commander-in-chief, and this one's more clear. He commands the army and the navy of the United States of America. Up next is the power to appoint. The president has the power to appoint or choose leadership positions in the federal government. And these include diplomats, ambassadors, federal judges, Supreme Court justices, and members of the executive departments. Now, should the president choose somebody who is unworthy of the position, say, somebody that sleeps on the job all the time, remember, the Senate will approve or deny this position. That's called checks and balances. The president can also negotiate treaties with other nations. And again, same thing, the Senate is gonna be the one to approve or deny these treaties. They're also given the power to veto legislation, which means to reject a proposed law. And finally, they have the power to pardon. Now this is somewhat controversial, but the President of the United States has the power to excuse someone for their federal crimes. I always look at it this way. In your school, the principal is the closest thing to the President. And the principal can say, hey you, go to detention, you're in trouble. But at the same time, a principal can walk into detention and say, you know what, what are you doing here? Go back to class. They have the power not only to enforce the rules, but they have the power to excuse people for breaking the rules. Well, we did it. We went through every power in Article 2 of the Constitution. Now, unfortunately, these are only the expressed powers of the president. And when we say expressed powers, we mean powers that are actually listed or written down. But the president has some secret powers or powers that are not written down, and we call those implied powers. I always compare this to the secret Taco Bell menu. So there's an express menu of written down things that we can point to and say, hey, I want that one. But there's also an unlisted secret menu made up of ingredients that they already have of which they can make, it's just not written down that they will make them. This is the Presidential Powers Secret Taco Bell menu. And first up is the control over a presidential cabinet. Believe it or not, this cabinet of advisors that's so critical to helping the president do his job is actually not listed in the Constitution. It's been a presidential favorite to order this up every presidency since George Washington. Another important power is that of executive orders. And this one gets very complicated and tricky. So hold on to your butts. We all know it's the president's job to enforce the law, but hey, sometimes he he can't do it if the laws don't let him. And if that's the case, then he can make an executive order to help him carry out the law. Now, an executive order has the weight of a law, but it's not an actual law that's passed by Congress. One of the best examples I can give is Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Now, Lincoln was waiting for Congress to make a law that would prohibit slavery in the United States, but that law never came because Congress was divided between North and South, and so he said to heck with that, I'm going to make an executive order, I'm declaring that slavery should be prohibited, and I will begin enforcing this law. And last on the list of implied powers is what we call emergency wartime powers. Now, if the United States of America is attacked, we don't have time for Congress to write war and peace. There's no time for them to discuss and debate going to war. We are in an emergency. We need to act now, and the president gets more powers when we're in an emergency situation. This makes a lot of sense, it's just not written in the Constitution. Two down and one to go. Article 3 talks about the third and final branch of the government, and this is the judicial branch, probably better known to you as the Supreme Court. 
So let's take a closer look and see what they're supposed to do. Now the main function of the Supreme Court is to interpret the law. So what does that look like? Well, an interpretation is trying to explain something. Looking here at the glass, we could interpret it as being half empty or half full. Now they're not gonna be looking at glasses of water. What they're gonna be interpreting is our rights and freedoms and do we have them or not? Or are they limited or protected? Now, Article 3 does not include any requirements to be a Supreme Court judge. Unlike the legislative branch and the executive branch, which all have a list of requirements, that's not really the case for the Supreme Court. Article 3 leaves it completely blank. We also do not vote for Supreme Court justices like we would a president or a lawmaker. They are nominated by the president and approved by the Senate. So there are no elections. You're never gonna see a sign saying, vote for me for Supreme Court judge of the United States of America. So what are the powers that are listed in Article 3 that tell us what the Supreme Court can actually do? First up is they rule and judge on cases with foreign ambassadors. They're also going to rule on cases that involve different states, so Florida sues Georgia or vice versa. The Supreme Court is the only one that has the authority to rule on these cases. Article 3 also mentions the main function, which is for them to interpret the law. Now, the most important power of the Supreme Court is not actually written down in the Constitution. I'm talking about judicial review. This power allows the judicial branch to check or stop the actions of the other two branches. The first time they used this power was in a case called Marbury versus Madison, and it doesn't really matter about the case, but you need to know that this case establishes judicial review. It's the first time they used it, and nobody ever called them out on it. And so now the Supreme Court has this very important check on all the other branches. If they think the president's doing something that's out of line, they can say, Mr. President, what you are doing is unconstitutional, and the president has to stop doing that. Same thing goes for laws made by Congress. And speaking of types of laws, there's a couple of different kinds that the judicial branch will interpret. That's civil, criminal, juvenile, and military. Civil laws help citizens settle their disagreements, and these disagreements can be over contracts, personal injury, property stuff, or even divorce or family issues. Nobody's gonna be arrested because nobody's done a crime. It's just a disagreement between people. On the other hand, criminal laws are laws that make certain actions a crime. These are going to involve a trial court where the state is prosecuting a defendant and trying to determine their innocence or guilt. Criminal law will absolutely involve an arrest, and if found guilty, we're dealing with punishments that are not just monetary, but may include a loss of freedom, meaning you're going to jail. Now, juvenile laws involve crimes, but only for those under the age of 18. And it's going to work much the same way, except the state is going to be a little bit more lenient because we're not always making the best decisions when we're under the age of 18. Military law is a completely different justice system that involves only those who are serving in the military, okay? The army, the navy, you know what I mean. They have their own rules and justice system because they have a lot of different responsibilities. Like, my job is to teach, your job is to learn as a student, and a soldier's job is to defend the nation and fight in war, and that might require them to do things that regular civilians don't need to do, like kill enemy soldiers. And so our justice system is not equipped to handle these situations, and so there's an entirely different, separate justice system called military law. Okay, we made it through all the three branches. Let's finish strong here with Article 5. Now, Article 5 of the Constitution is a short one, but it tells us how to amend the Constitution. Now, you've probably heard this before. The Constitution is a living, living document. document. But really, all that means is it can change or adapt to the times. Remember, in 1791, when this is ratified, slavery was still legal, Native Americans weren't considered citizens, and women couldn't vote. It is a very good thing Article 5 exists so that we can make changes and adapt to the times. Now the amendment process is a two-step process and the first step is called proposal. The main method here is for two-thirds of Congress to propose a change to the Constitution. That means two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate need to be on the same page. This can be really difficult to do, so they included an alternative strategy. Every state has their own lawmakers, and if two-thirds of the state lawmakers call a national convention, 
then Congress must meet to discuss making a change to the Constitution. They wanted to make sure that if Congress was unwilling to do this, that the states could kind of crack the whip and say, hey, it's time to talk about this change. Now, a proposal by definition is a suggestion, right? Will you? Will you make this change? But it would be really weird for somebody to propose and then accept. And so Congress, who proposes this change, cannot accept the change. We need a second party to say, I do. And when someone agrees and makes something official, we call that ratification. And that's step two of the amendment process. Now, the main method of doing this is to have three-fourths of those state lawmakers be the one to stand up and say, I do. The alternative method is when three-fourths of the states call a special ratification convention. Each state does it a little bit differently, but it's designed to let the people be more involved in the ratification process in case the state lawmakers don't want to do it. Now, this is a rare thing, the special unicorn. We had to use this on the 21st Amendment to repeal the prohibition of alcohol. The people really stood up and said, hey, we're not going to put this in the lawmakers' hands. We are going to be the ones to call this ratification convention and make sure we can sell alcohol in America. Now, we use this amendment process to make the first 10 changes to the Constitution, which we call the Bill of Rights. And in the Bill of Rights, we can find all kinds of rights and freedoms of the people that protect us from the government. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks so much for sticking to the end of my video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. We'll make more videos soon.